Hi everyone. Hopefully this is all working very well. I think you should all be able to hear me. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. In the waiting room, you've been listening to the the calm and soothing sounds of my new Prophet 6, which I got this week, which is extremely exciting. For those of you who don't know, it's a polyphonic analog synthesizer. I've wanted to have one for a long, long time. And I thought because I have one now, I'm going to make a little patch on there and have it play some random arpeggiated notes while everyone waits for the stream to start. So that's what you've been listening to. Um, welcome to the stream. I'm going to get this background music turned off and we'll get going. Thanks for all the new followers who have just joined. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, Let's see, what do we got here? We've got, in the last few minutes, a bunch of new followers. We've got Snobby Snob, we've got Dream Bops, LFZ Music, Daniel Forrest, Yusku, and Simfane, all who have joined and followed in the last few minutes. So thank you so much for that. Oh, and Rhino Future just now. Thanks so much for joining the stream, and thank you for following. Um, I don't know, if many of you, I don't know if a bunch of you have seen the past streams I've done. I haven't really done that many of them. This is probably like number three or four or something, but I'm trying to make it more of a regular and consistent thing. Um, so this is me in my attempt at making it more official, higher quality. Uh, as you can see of the beautiful background I've got going, welcome to my stream, smiley face, some nice looping GIFs or GIFs, depending on uh, how you like to speak English, I suppose. Um, We've got a nice pink background that I created and a fake chroma key green screen behind me to make me look very, very professional. So uh, don't start a war. No, I'm not going to start a war over that. That's not. This is not the time or place to start the gif gif war. I, I don't want to have that kind of conflict or tension in this chat or in this stream, so I'm sorry I ever brought it up. Uh... What synth is it? Yeah, Shia, that was a brand new Prophet 6 that I recently received or bought from a second-hand owner in Sweden. Uh, Sequential Circuits, Dave Smith Instruments, Prophet 6. Highly renowned. Hard G gang. Oh, look, I'm also the Hard G gang, but like I said, I'm not getting into it. I'm not getting into it. Um, cool. So I guess before we get started... I'll go and I'm going to give you guys some updates. Uh, we, oh, thanks for the new followers. We got Secus Official. I think I said that right. Sex, Secus. <laughs> and uh, Xantho Galactus. Thank you for following. Um, yeah, updates. I, since the last stream, have moved house. I'm in a new location. Partly where I'm not showing you the background. It's very messy in here. Um, I'm in the studio, but there's like, I haven't had a chance to properly put the foam on the walls to make it like soundproofed or whatever. So it looks really messy. It looks really bad, but it's all functioning great. I'm in a new house. Uh, I'm in a new location, a new area of Melbourne. For those of you who don't know, I live in Melbourne and we've been in one of the longest, most serious quarantine lockdowns in the world, which is just now starting to come to an end. But Literally only in the last few days have we had any semblance of freedom. So that's uh, that's all very exciting. Um, I've got some new gear, which I'm going to show you maybe in some future streams. I've got some new, uh, a ton of new music to show. Um, but we'll have to wait and see for like when we're going to hear that stuff. But for now, today's stream is going to be all about my most recent release, Higher. Um, if you haven't heard the song, it came out a couple weeks ago, I think, around that time. Uh, it's a fun little song. It's actually a very old song that I made quite some time ago. Uh, it's like, I think back in 2017 is when I produced it. And it was really like finished like 2018. So the session that we're actually going to look at today is kind of where my production mindset was at like a couple of years ago. So it's actually a little bit outdated, but... 
that being said, I'm going to sort of go through it and sort of explain like what I did at the time and what I would do differently now, the kind of sounds I was using, the kind of production choices I made back then and how the song came to be. Uh, going to be funny when this stream gets a copyright strike. You're absolutely right. That's going to be positively hilarious and I can't wait for that. Uh, but you know what? For those of you who are watching right now live, they can't strike me in real time unless they have super fast fingers. Uh, look, I don't know how it works. I My label knows that I'm doing this. They know that um, I'm the owner, I'm the creator and owner of the song. So look, it's if anything happens, they'll get it fixed, I hope. If you're watching Inertia, please don't copyright strike this video. I don't know why you would. Um, yeah, so thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thanks, Slowcon, for the follow. Thanks, YXOF20 for the follow. Um, please let me know in the chat if there's any issues with the video or audio quality. I think it should all be functioning perfectly well, but if there is any problems or if there's any, like, dropouts or anything like that, um, just let me know because... Oh, yeah, I've, I've already, I'm definitely saving the VOD after the stream. Uh, I've actually got it. I'm, like, using OBS to save it like while it's re recording and streaming in real time. So they'll be back up and archive and I'll probably archive it on YouTube as well. So don't you worry about that. Yeah. If there's any issues with the stream quality, let me know. I'm very new to this. I don't know how it looks or sounds. I'm using a very clunky setup with very rudimentary gear. So please don't be afraid to tell me if it sucks. Um, but I suppose it's time to get into it. Uh, yeah, if, and of course, while we're doing this, if you have questions or anything you would like me to go over or like answer for you, go over in detail, um, I'm more than happy to do so. Please just like send a message in the chat and um, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, Egnarok, hi, how you doing? Thanks for tuning in. Get all your friends to join if you can. Make it a party. Okay. All right, we're going to switch over to my Ableton session now and we can have a look at the song. Um, how do I do this? Ah, uh, yep. There we go. Here we are in Ableton. Um, thanks, Pluko, for the follow. Thank you for joining. So here we are in the session. Um, like I said, the session's a couple years old. And by a couple, I mean like maybe three, three and a half years old. About to raid. Oh gosh, I'm getting raided. Well, that's cool. Welcome to the stream. If you're if you're new here, haven't seen you in so long. I'm glad you're back. Um, thank you for joining. I think now would be as good a time as any for me to just play the song, and then I will get into like how how it came to be. So here we are, guys. This is higher. So that is just like a plinky piano coming out of contact. I'm sure. If you're any of you are producers, you're very familiar with Contact. This is literally like a New York grand piano preset that you can have in the stock Contact instruments. Uh, so that by itself just sounds like this. Just EQ'd it and like a bit of compression. But then like the cool pluckiness comes from these layers down here. One of which is, well, that's two layers. So one of them is Omnisphere. Maybe I'll, un I'll have to unfreeze some stuff as I go. The reason I have it frozen is to protect my CPU, but um, we'll unfreeze it. I think we're, we should be all right. Omnisphere, I'm using like a, let's open it up, have a look. I'm using uh, like one of the, I like Omnisphere for the, like the sample libraries that they use. They have these really cool like, uh, Let's see. Oh, yeah, I've got... Yeah, so I don't use the synthesizer engine so much in Omnisphere, but I use the the sample element. So here I'm using the Resonator, a Zimbira mute um, accent patch. I haven't really done much to it. There's no effects on that in the plugin. I'm just using the sound itself. So that's kind of cool, like plucky um, kalimba sound. Just a bit of reverb and EQ on there. Then underneath that, we've got this silent patch, which is very just like simplistic, clean patch. Uh, let's unfreeze that as well. Um, 
Yeah, I love the M Omnisphere Pluck sound. I actually really love all the samples that you can have in it. Like, Omnisphere has a bunch of really good sounds. Um, fun fact, Wayfarers invented seventh, seventh chords. That is true. That's true. I also invented ninths, suspended fourths, uh, thirteenths, and the 2-5-1 progression. I also invented silent Velcro and silent Drape Runners. Uh... Loving the vocals in the track. Yes, I'm going to get to the vocals in a minute. That was Eldevine, as I mentioned. She's, um, we did a special technique to make the vocals sound as good as they do, um, which I'll get into in a minute. But this silence patch, yeah, it's nothing special. It's just like, what is it? Some sine waves. There it is if you want to have a look. Nothing special. Bit of EQ, bit of reverb. Um, if I'm glossing over anything too quickly, let me know and I can try and go back and like go into more depth. But I don't want to make you all bored by the technical aspects of everything. So also invent the secondary dominant. And um, and the C in racer comes from the C major scale that he also invented. That is true. Um, I don't know where you guys are getting this information, but it is all true. Um, uh, can I actually talk about the chords a bit? Like those different voicings are really the source to me. Sure, I'll get into that. I've got all the MIDI here, so you can have a look at how I voiced the chords. Um, got. It's just like a, a, a sample. Um, and I've done like velocity automation to give it like that tick -tick -tick, like that drum roll feel. Really nothing special there. Um, a few little sticks with some reverb on it. These are literally just like side stick drumstick samples um, with reverb on them edited together to make like a percussion loop. Um, and that is the, if that's the whole like verse one percussion, the vocal underneath, that's the special part. Um, oh wait, you wanted me to go talk about the chords. Um, can you talk about the decision to key change in the intro? Uh, I didn't do a key change in the intro, but there is a key. There's like a, there's mod, there's key modulation in the bridge section. Is that what you're talking about? I'm not sure about the intro. There is no key change there. Um, uh, yes, I did carry music to term in my uterus and gave birth after nine months. I invented and gave birth to music. Um, and I invented sound. That's all very true. Um, yeah, so the chords, well, let's see, let's have a look. I can't actually remember. I mean, honestly, that's pretty, like, dead simple stuff. Like, that is three note chords so we got oh let's go here uh why can't i hear it oh yeah there we go so okay so i guess there's something to be said there there's like um Okay, enough facts about the origin of it all, of sound in general. Look, I mean, it's good to know about the history of music and the history of sound and the inventors and all that kind of stuff. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, so yeah, we've got a we've got an inverted C major chord here. So, so actually, like, what you like? Are some people, I guess, if they were writing chords, they might if they were doing E in the bass, like I've done here, they might actually do this chord, which is which is an E minor chord. But if you raise that degree up basically you're inverting a c chord so you've got all the notes of a c chord you've got a c a g and an e except instead of the e being the third voice in the chord um you've got it as the the bottom voice so that's called a, an inversion or a first inversion or a second inversion i think it's a first inversion um so there's bass movement but it's still lending itself to the progression <laughs> uh and then just an F, G. It's a G with some extra spice. We've got, let's see, we've got G, G, B, C. And then the seventh. So there's a seventh and there's also the root note of the song, which is C. So we've got like a suspended kind of feel there because there's tension here in the chords like we've got this b and the c which are like two competing notes but they're both part of the scale and that's good you want the tension here because this 
chord is resolving up to the minor, the relative minor, which is A minor. Um, so there's that, that repeats. And instead of resolving to the A, we resolve to the C, which is the major tonic. It's like, feels very nice to do that. And then here, we've got some spice. We've got the, uh, we raise the seventh degree. Well, actually, I don't know if it's a race. I don't know my music theory very well, but. No, no. So yeah, that's right. We're going, we're resolving to the, the, the minor, which is the A, but instead of going from the G, we're going from a G sharp. So we've like raised the fifth. It's like a flat six or a sharp five. I'm not sure. Ask someone who studies jazz, but um, resolving to the A again, but with that extra spice, it kind of sounds like very emotional. And then we've got a, a um, we've got a major two. So instead of a, a regular two, which would normally be minor, we've got a major two here, which is a D major, D major seven actually. And then a, honestly, what is that? F, G. It's like a five with a suspended four, I think. Anyway, enough about that. No one cares about that. <laughs> Could you please zoom in on the notes so you can make the inversions better? I hope I zoomed in enough. I can do this. Um, but look, this vote is going to be up later. So if you really want to like have a tighter look at it, you can look at the recording after. Are the different instruments voice different to my ears playing tricks? Um, Yes, they definitely are are but i don't really have time to go through every chord voicing so but yes like i do different inversions for different instruments because different sonic qualities like sit together differently and like i would want the bass to follow the the roots like really you know it's kind of like depending on what sound you're using you will invert and compose and voice the chords or the melodies differently um Oh, well, I'm glad I'm helping. I, like, I don't know my theory that well. I know it like how it works in my head, but I don't know how to actually articulate it very well. Um, anyway, let's continue to the next section of the song. We've got these chords under the under the vocal. Oh, I should probably talk about the vocal. So, I'll get more into this later. But we recorded the vocal at a pitched a pitch lower than what you're hearing. So I actually recorded like what I did is I took the demo of the song. I pitched the whole thing down like three semitones. We recorded the vocal to that and then when we put the vocal in the, the proper session we pitched the vocal up so it has this like not chipmunk because it's only subtle but it's like slightly raised in pitch so it's not the actual natural sound of olivia's voice it's um it's pitched up a bit right so that's kind of why it sounds more childish more feminine um she's got a beautiful voice Anyway, but we thought it was cool to like do this kind of cool digital manipulation. Not, it's actually not even digital manipulation. It's the same way that if you pitch up an analog piece of audio, it speeds up. When you speed it up, the pitch is raised. So, um, Yeah, so it kind of just gives the it gives the vocal or whatever you're doing it to. It works really well in vocals. It gives this vocal the this quality of being pitched up, but you don't really notice where like you don't know that it's pitched up because it's subtle. But it does add this quality that you can't get from a natural recording or a natural regular sounding recording. Um, and then behind here, we've got some like I actually took just a little snippet of the vocal comp because I actually we recorded and comped the vocals in another session and then we came back with the like complete vocal takes. So um, this is like what you're hearing in the vocal is a bunch of vocal takes comped and edited together. Like I got the best parts of each one. Um, so yeah, I took I took the, the completed vocal comp and I just like, I got one of the O's and I like pitched it up in the sampler thing here and put some MIDI notes and it's like bending up and down. So yeah, you get this cool like stretched sound, which is really cool. Um, yeah. Let's keep listening. That's where it gets exciting. I really like the drums in this song. I think the drums hit really hard. I'm quite proud of them. I actually made the drums from scratch myself, like synthetically. Um, well, the main drums anyway. Um, but before I continue, I'd just like to say thank you to 13 Luntz 
to Fritz Music, to HST39, to COG001, and to Keyline Music for following me in the last few minutes. Um, and thanks to everyone sending messages in the chat. I'm going to try and cover as many of those questions and things like that as I can. We've also got a follow from Honeyversu. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> you guys are so kind. Um, what plugin did you use for the bass in the pre-chorus? I'm about to cover that. It's actually the Korg M1, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, you think it's better without the vocal? Look, everyone loves an instrumental. I love the instrumental too. Um, you know, but I'm trying to get played on radio here. So <laughs> uh, let's continue. So the pre-chorus is... Drums pick up here a bit. So another like drum roll, that's just a sample with like velocity automation. Some snap samples. So you get like syncopated drum roll with like the accents and the kick. The kick is filtered here because it's the pre-chorus but I'll get into the full kick and snare in the next part which is like the main chorus part um, am I going to go in depth about the FM synthesis on the drums I do have a bit of FM synthesis going on here and I'll I can I don't I, it's hard to go in depth because these are actually exported samples like I don't have the FM patch here in the session so i might have to do that on another stream but i can go I, I'm, I'm actually thinking about doing a full stream just on like the power of fm synthesis and how i use it um so yes to answer you i'll talk a bit about that now but i might not be able to go as in-depth as you like um <clears throat> okay so we've got on top of that we've got the bass so someone did ask about the bass Two of the base layers are from the Korg M1, which I'll show you right now. The M1, it was originally like a, a classic piece of equipment made by Korg as like a physical synthesizer slash sampler slash thing. Um, it was in the 80s originally, but this is the plug-in version because I don't have an original M1. So uh, that's what it looks like. There's a cl that classic like do 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 that house song show me love that uses this organ patch from the m1 that's like the classic use of it let's see if i can play it there's a bit of latency there so i'm struggling to play it but you get the idea that is the exact patch from that song they used an M1 on the original recording. Um, um, and I like it because it adds like a nice thick layer of like, um, it adds like this extra layer of like thickness and harmonic on top of the bass. So I've got a sub bass layer here. Baby. Which is literally just like a low ass, like super low rumbly sub so that it sounds really good on big speakers. But the extra layers on top give it that sort of punch and like extra warmth that you can't get just from a sub and then in other sections of the song i've got another m1 patch which is a bass guitar patch um there's a there's so many sounds in the m1 like i can't even get into how in depth it is there's like thousands of sounds um and that's like and they're all infinitely editable and like there's loads of cool effects it's like super duper 80 sounding it's a really awesome instrument um but this is a preset that i probably just altered it's a it's a um it's called killer bass i guess but it's basically a a bunch of different bass guitar sounds and i filtered out the low end and stuff like i've done a bunch of processing on it to make it fit in the mix better because we've got the other sub layers and stuff going on too so yeah like i'm just drawing from my arsenal of of 80s sounds that I have access to and sort of using them in a way that I could make it fit. Um, 
that I use the same sensors in flash drive? I don't know. I'm going to do probably a stream on flash drive in the future, but I don't, that was so long ago that I don't, a lot of the techniques I'm talking about now, I didn't even know back then. So it's kind of a different time period, which would be fun to go back and look, but I don't necessarily know. Um, let's see. Okay, there's beef happening in the chat. Guys, keep it civil. <laughs> I don't care that he said anything about the vocal. You can take it or leave it, like whatever. Uh, oh, we got some new followers. Awesome. And Evergreen, Green, thank you for following. Sass David, thank you for following. You can get a taste. Thanks for following, and I hope I do get a taste. Um, okay, the chat's distracting me, so I'm going to keep powering on through. That's the bass parts. Together in the chorus, they sound like this. So that's the M1 on top of the sub bass. Why you turn saturated drive so high? Because saturation's awesome. It's not actually doing that much saturation though. Like look. Because the level going into the saturator is quite, like not that high. And then also I've got the output of the saturator pulled back as well so that it's not like super duper loud. So you're just getting a little bit of saturation, but you're not like crazy boosting the volume. It's good gain staging practicing if you're ever trying to find out what that means. <laughs> I only learned about it recently. Um, if, you're, if your saturator isn't at 36, you're doing it wrong. That's exactly right. And I also did, um, for those of you who don't know, I, I actually invented saturation. Um, Will it lose the quality of sounds? No, it's saturation adds like harmonic distortion. It changes the quality of the sound to make it like richer and stuff. And I, I use the Ableton saturator like sometimes, but I nowadays I use more like decapitator from sound toys and like fab filter satin and stuff like that, which are like, they just sound a bit better. Um, so the drums, like I said, I really like the drums in this song. Let's play it in... Uh, Keyline Music says be careful because it adds a lot of new frequencies that you might have cut and yes that's very true you anytime you distort or like overdrive or saturate something you're getting new harmonics being added to the sound which is generally why I follow my saturations with an EQ to reshape or re sort of cut back on those things that have been added if they're in excess but like the combination of a saturator and an equalizer can do a like can make a sound sound so much richer than it was before um do you group stuff as you're going or during mixdown? Um, I do a bit of both. Grouping is so aggressive. I don't know how grouping can be aggressive. There's not really anything on the groups. Like it's just, these are just how I organize the sounds in my head so that it's like easier for my brain to do admin while I'm working. Um, and for this, I actually just regrouped everything because it was like simpler. And when I was doing the session, it wasn't grouped like this. Um, but yeah, I group, like, if I have two layers making up a snare or a kick sound or something, I'll group them together just for, like, simplicity's sake. And also, grouping's good because you can process the group as well as the individual elements. So it's like... <laughs> um, yeah, sloppy with grouping. I mean, look, I, I think grouping is, is sometimes really good. Sometimes you don't need to do it. Like, it's the same thing as kind of bussing things together. Um, and, like... If you have a whole drum bus, then you, you can process not only the individual drums, but also the drum group as a whole, which can really help your mix. And just like, it can even just add character to the drums that you would otherwise not be able to get. Because when you have layers coming together, that are being compressed or saturated. It's like you get this whole energy, the interaction of the dynamics between those sounds kind of makes it sound like even more lively and, and, and fun than before. So I like to experiment with that stuff. Sometimes it's not necessary, though. really depends on the song. Um, Ramon Pang, you're learning a lot. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you for tuning in, and I'm glad that I can give you some knowledge. Um, yeah, so the drums, here they are. So there's a bunch of stuff going on there. You'll hear that there's like the think break samples, which is like that classic. Um, 
Like that's the tambourine sound from that breakbeat that everyone uses. It's like the drum and bass kind of breakbeat. Um, and I've chopped up. I've got the break woo, the break yeah, the break snare, and the break kick. So I've chopped up all the different components of that breakbeat and like edited the edited them the, the, edited them as like little accents over the top of the main beat. So it adds like a bunch of texture and I think I've like panned them and EQ'd them all separately so they kind of have this width. The kick is right here. Oh, this will be interesting because I actually did this kick in the project itself. So let's have a look. I really like this kick. I don't know if it's translating through the stream, but that's a nice kick. Um, yeah, that's a pretty nice kick. Like, I reckon. What do you guys think? Um, so how did I do this? There's a plugin called Kick2, which is really cool. It's by Sonic Academy. Here it is. If you watched my last stream uh, where I did auto, I used this in that song as well. It's basically lets you create um, drum sounds, or specifically, it's best for kicks, but you can do all kinds of stuff in it. Um, and you can see that you can draw the envelope or the shape of the synthesized element. So like you've got this sub sub bass wave layer, you've got sub, and then you can add like how you want the sub to move over time, like pitch wise and amplitude wise. And then you've got these three kick click layers, which lets you add the texture on top. So it's basically like a dedicated plugin for building kick samples. And it's got EQ, distortion, drive, compressor, and all that. And it's really great. And I use it because it's so flexible, you can make any kind of kick sound you want. Um, uh, are you serious about tuning your kicks and snares? Depends. Sometimes they don't need to really be tuned. They just sound good. But if like, if you have a song that's really like dependent on everything being super duper locked in, then yeah, I mean, this, this plugin lets you tune things really accurately. It even has like the note values for the different frequencies and stuff, which is really useful. But Look, it's 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 more just the like, it's just if it sounds good, do it. You know, don't worry too much about that. Um, do you drag sample into kick then cook it? Uh, I usually don't. I usually just build from scratch using what they have here. But sometimes I will layer samples as another layer on top of the entire kick two layer after if it needs it. Sometimes I'll only use the sub part of kick two, and then I'll like use an external processor to add more texture and elements on top. Anyway, that's the kick. But then obviously I did a bunch after that plugin. Like if I turn all the effects off after the plugin, you'll see how it sounds. So let's have a look. That's just coming straight out of the plugin. So I kind of made it sound a bit warmer. Like I EQ'd out some of the harshness. Um, Boosted a little bit of the lows. K clip is cool. Um, it kind of adds like very transparent distortion, so it's good for gain staging because you can like, like you can see here, I'm clipping 2.5 decibels off the top of the kick. But you can't really tell. Like it's not really that audible, but you're at you're allowing the kick to sort of. If you then group the kick with something else later, like you're not going to get those extra 2.5 decibels of peaks messing with whatever compression you have going on. So it kind of just keeps the kick as a neat package. Do the same thing on snares. It's really, really useful. Um, this is a cool plugin. Very CPU intensive though. Uh, next, overdrive. Adding a little bit of crunch to the top end. And then another EQ just boosting where I thought it needed a bit of love. And then this is just an automated filter for certain sections of the song. You can see in the pre-chorus, just taking out a bunch of it, so it just set, like it sits in the background more. Um, that's just automation. Can you take me higher? Can you take me higher? So that kind of covers the kick. Um, yes, thank you for Pluko for rating me before. That was very cool. Um, really cool and punchy kick. Thank you so much. Um, the snare is kind of another cool element of this song. So let's have a listen to that. It's 
Yeah, crispy as. Um, so this is pretty fun. So you can see here, I've got like this group called snare clap. Um, and that is where I'm grouping together two layers. So we've got a snare layer, which I've completely made from scratch using operator um, and a bunch of processing, a lot of processing. And then there's this clap layer, which is called wavy clap one because I made the clap myself using white noise in a previous time. And then I exported that as a sample. So this is a customized, like I made that sound myself and I just saved it as a sample. And I layered those two elements together to get this snare clap. And you can see, and if I open up the delay time, you can see that the, the clap is coming 11 milliseconds before the snare. So you kind of get that like, like flam sound, makes it a bit more crunchy. Um, what's your opinion on frequencies of the kick and snare overlapping? If it sounds good, do it. I mean, I tend to cut out a lot of the lows out of my snares and I cut out a bit of the highs out of my kicks so that they kind of sit in their respective areas a little bit better. Um, just EQ if you need to. And if your kick, it, it, that matters more if your kicks and snares are playing at the same time, because then when you get that overlap of the two sounds playing at the same time, that can be a problem. So you kind of have to do a little bit of shaping so that when one, where they're playing at the same time, they're not occupying the same space. But I tend to not have my kicks and snares play at the same time. I like to have that kind of kick, snare, kick, snare kind of vibe. Thank you, Xenon Chameleon, for the follow. Um, Slowcon asks, do I start every track differently or stick with the lead first or the drums first? And there is no formula. I do everything different. Every time I create something, it generally comes from a different place. Um, I do unspeakable things for that Wave Racer sample pack. Well... What kind of unspeakable things are we talking about? Because I might have some news for you, demo tapes. I might have something in the works there. And look, I don't want to say too much about that, but let's just say I might have something happening in the world of sample packs. <laughs> um, I'll keep you guys updated on that. Um, as time, as time goes on, yes, it's quite exciting, and I'm quite happy with that. And the truth is, some of the sounds that you're hearing now in this session may even be in that little project that we're talking about. But I've said too much, so let's move on. Let's unfreeze this layer. So this snare, like I said, I made this snare from scratch. If you're ever like I, I don't like. I know a lot of people won't do this. But I like to make my drum sounds from scratch because it just like, firstly, I find it really fun. Secondly, I love the control that it gives me and I just love sound design and like understanding the anatomy of sound kind of thing. And like a lot of the time, a song idea will start from a sonic concept like that. So I'll be like, oh, I wonder if I can make a snare sound like this using this technique or whatever it might be. And I'll like give that a go and then I'll come up with something or I'll, it'll take me in a totally new direction that I wasn't anticipating, but like I end up creating a cool sound, which then becomes the basis of a song. So like it's kind of this crossover between, and that goes into another question that someone asked before. It's like, how do I start every song? It's like a lot of the time I'm just messing around with sound design. I'll be like, I wonder if I can make this sound a certain way or whatever. And, or like create this sound from scratch. And I think I didn't, that's not how this song in particular started, but that is a, a, a how a lot of my songs will start. And um, that's a bit of a tangent, but like I did, basically I'm saying that because I created the snare in this song, the snare layer from scratch. So that's what it sounds like. And yeah, there is a bit of group processing on there too, which I'll cover in a minute, but the core of the sound is coming from here. And you can see I've got three layers of operator. This is an instrument rack, so basically means when you play a note, all three of these layers will sound at the same time. Uh, so each one of these layers is dedicated to a different section, I guess you could say, like a different part of the snare drum. Uh, 
sorry if I'm missing some of your questions. Um, I, I will definitely come back or you can feel free to ask them again if I, if I do happen to miss them. Um, yeah, so we've got like different layers of the snare drum. One of them is actually turned off, which means I'm probably only ended up using, yeah, I ended up only using these two layers, I guess. Yeah, that third layer is not being used. But let's have a look. So we've got... This layer is like the snare body, the body of the snare. So I'm using Operator, which is just Ableton's like simple FM synth. And I'm not even using the FM part. I'm using one of the oscillators with like a sine wave. Or just a short like blip. That's all it is. That's like the body of the snare. So I've tuned it to be in the area of where a snare would be. You can see there it's tuned to 262 hertz, which is kind of where most snare drums live. And then on top of that, we've got our noise layer. Now this is like the snappy part of the snare drum. Um, so again, it's operator. This time we've got white noise and just a very short burst of sound and compressed it. Oh, and I'm actually side chaining this to the body so that Kind of makes it like sucky sounding like the it makes it sound like more compressed because when you the body will come in and that will be take that will take more of the space because it's kicking the crispy snappy part it's like making it duck underneath it so you can kind of hear how the snare like like kind of sucks in so those are the two elements of the snare and then after that we've got you know some eq to really shape it make the sound because like by itself, those sounds don't really sound like a snare drum. Like, let's turn off this processing. That's what it sounds like without the processing. It's like very weak and not very like snare drum. Like it sounds very synthetic. So I had to do quite a lot to make it sit together. So after like this group, um, that's the sound source. And then after that, this is how I'm affecting the sound source. So we've got an EQ firstly, which is just like, well, actually, sorry, let's turn that off. I'll go through them one at a time. Oops. Yeah, we've got this EQ. Nothing, just getting rid of, just accentuating where it needs to be accentuated and getting rid of what doesn't need to be there. A very heavy compressor. Like really squashing it. That does quite a lot. Because you kind of need it to be like one piece. So compressing it together like that's good. Overdrive. That's doing a lot as well. Adding a lot of like natural grit and sort of harmonics makes it sound less like a synthesizer oscillator and more like a real life sound. Then we've got a saturator. Same vibe. Then another EQ because we've done all this distortion and compression, we need to EQ it again. And kind of just that kind of speaks for itself. A limiter doing barely anything. A saturator again. So this is set to digital clip mode, which is kind of like what K clip was doing before. It's really just like topping off the peaks. A utility. This is boosting the level, but it's also pulling out because I think the noise layer in the in the sound design was stereo. And it was too wide, so I kind of reduced the width a little bit by pulling the mid-side balance more towards the mids. Got another EQ here. And another EQ. This one's set to mid-side mode. Mid-side EQ is something I use a lot, and it lets you EQ the middle. If you're, if you're working in stereo, if you're working with a stereo sound source, you can EQ the middle, like... The center frequent the center audio and the side audio separately so the blue line is the middle and the i just realized that could go away um and the yellow line is the sides so you can see i'm like boosting some of the sides but cutting also some of the sides at the top and then where i've cut the sides out i've boosted the middle a little bit um and that's the snare sound but then we've also got going through this um so this is this group covers the snare and the clap layer as well so you can hear them together 
And that's going through like, yeah, compressor, saturator, EQ, another K clip, really make it sit nicely together. Oh, and then a lovely room reverb from Valhalla. Love Valhalla room. Again, because all these are, these are all synthetic sources, like they're all digitally created using digital oscillators. So I wanted it to sound more natural. So I threw like, I wanted to make it sit in a space. Valhalla room's really good at that. And that's the snare. Now, what did I miss? Mr. Bill uses that uh, uh, method, does he? That's cool. He's very, he's very, very like knowledgeable with his sound design. Um, you'll top off my peaks. Puppy Mountain is going to top off my peaks. Um, I think I might have to end the stream and call the cops. Uh, that's quite scary. No, just joking. Puppy Mountain is a good friend of mine. Everyone say hi to Puppy Mountain. He's Chris. He has his own Twitch channel and stream as well. He does awesome DJ sets, extremely good taste in music, and just a lovely, beautiful human. So that's Puppy Mountain. Um, yeah, so EQ looks like a fat man sleeping on his back. Yeah, it's a portrait of myself. Um, I feel everyone here is super focused. <laughs> everyone listen. It's class time. It's time for school. Do you usually want to cut more of the high end on the sides? Uh, no. Usually you actually want to boost the, the high end on the sides, but I felt in that context because I was using raw white noise, it was just a bit too much. Um, but if you're doing mid-side normally, a lot a classic technique with mid-side is boosting the highs on the sides and then you get this beautiful airy stereo width, which people love. Um, I know I've missed some of your comments and questions, so I'm going to try and come back to that stuff, but I want to keep powering through. So we've got the kicks and the snares and... We've got our breakbeat samples together. They sound like this. Like that's 90% of the drum sound right there. There's also a hi-hat layer down here, which is kind of not really that audible. Uh, we've got, this is, I made this high, I made all the drums, I guess, from, I can't even remember doing this, but yeah, this is a, a, a hi-hat, literally just made of white noise in operator. I EQ'd all, all the low end, a little bit of shaping in the highs. It's got a very highly resonant filter on it to give it like that metallic kind of peak. And it's just a basic electronic hi-hat sound. Um, I didn't really want to have a natural sounding hi-hat for this particular song. Um, so that's what I did. We've got a, what's that? A 909 crash? Yeah. That's just a very wide process 909 crash sample. I think it's from Native Instruments Machine, maybe. I can't really remember. Um, we've got a whoosh. I love these whoosh sounds. I use them all the time. I use that, um, similar technique to what I did with the hi-hats and like how I would create like a shaker. So you've got like white noise coming out of an operator um, but there's like an envelope on the filter and on the amplitude so that it kind of goes it fades out from nothing kind of sounds like a karate chop like um, the grain delay is giving it a little bit of like width and like frequency modulation um, I think yeah because it's a frequency and then there's just like some delay give it some space and width make it sound nice and airy and windy um, bit of reverb, bit of compression, why not? Yeah, that's cool percussive element. I use that in a lot of songs coming up as well, so. Oh yeah, it's the side chaining with utility. That's a good question. I, I think this is the first time I ever did that and I don't know if I have ever done it since. I was having trouble using like conventional sidechain compression in this song. So I actually automated the sidechains, um, or most of them at least, using utility. Like I literally drew in volume automation with a utility plugin because it just sounded cleaner. It was very tedious, but it sounds clean and nice. So I just did it that way. But that's not something I always do. Um, yeah, so we got, 
What's next? Oh yeah, someone asked before about the FM. I hope this isn't boring. I hope me getting all technical and stuff is is interesting for you people. I don't I don't know. Like it's interesting to me. Thank you, Boone, for the follow. Um, Yorty says, thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for watching. It's the opposite of boring. Okay, well, I'll keep going then. I'm glad you guys are all enjoying it. Um, uh, where was I? Metallic hit. Someone asked me before about the FM stuff. This is a sample I made using FM8, which is an FM synthesizer. I don't have the patch here in this project because I made it in a previous project, but this is a sound I exported. Basically, I will have to do more in-depth sort of coverage of how I make my FM stuff because it's kind of hard to explain without demonstrating it. But frequency modulation is a type of synthesis where like you have different oscillators modulating other oscillators and they kind of create these bell like glassy metallic tones which can be very very um interesting like the classic dx7 is an fm synthesizer that's where you get that classic vibey electric piano 80 sound um and i love fm synthesis i like adore it i actually have i have a i bought i'm not going to show you now but i bought a physical FM synthesizer module thing, which is based on the Sega uh, Genesis console chip, like the, the sound chip in the Sega Genesis console. And it's so cool, but that's for another time. Uh, FM synthesis is awesome. I made this little metallic kit, which is kind of, I only use it sparingly because it's so like, it's so intense. It's like jarring, but that's kind of what's cool about it. Uh, more technical equals less boring. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. That's good to know. Um, you have an essay due in two hours, but this is more important. Mm, well, that depends. Education's pretty important. What's the essay about? Maybe I can help you. <laughs> uh, can you discuss the squeezy sound you feature in most of the fills? Uh, yeah, I will. There's a whole effects section, which I will, um, which I'll cover that. Um, but yes. Let's keep powering on through, shall we? I love that sound. I use that in other songs too. And that's the same thing, just reversed. So yeah, I like to create sounds and export them as audio and then I can like use them as audio assets in future projects. Like sometimes instead of making a song, I'll just spend a day like doing sound design and exporting audio samples. And then when I do come to creating a song, I'll have this like arsenal of sounds which is partly why I do have a sample pack in the works because it means I can... Um... Oh, did I just get a donation? Thank you so much for the donation. That is so, so kind. I don't actually have the donation details um, here in my stream manager. I don't know how that works yet. I'm not like Twitch affiliate or like whatever, so I don't... I'm still working towards that, but anyone who's donating or tipping... That is very much appreciated. Thank you so much. And Boost Boost, thank you for the follow just now. Um, also, I'm a very eloquent teacher. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You're very kind. Um, but seriously, if you have an essay... Oh, that wasn't you who had the essay, but Honey Versu, you've got an essay? I don't know, man. Probably should go do it. Tell me what it's about, and I'll see if I can help you. Um, anyway, where were we? More little like reversed, sort of sweepy sounds. Nothing really special there. Stock Ableton Latin percussion vibra slap sample. Use that all the time. Um, these are just like little ear candy elements, ear candy percussion. Got some tom fills. <laughs> wow, that's so good. <laughs> Sorry. That's so epic. I love how I, ch <laughs> I chopped at the... <laughs> I don't know why that's making me laugh so much, but that is so epic. <laughs> so these are like, I guess they're called Zenheiser. Tom I think I got these from my friend Randall. Yeah, they um, these are like classic 80s, like Tom, the gated reverb Tom sounds. 
and like it wasn't enough for me to just like <laughs> pretend I have a drum kit of like five huge gigantic rack toms I had to also program in little like stutter edits just to make it sound like I was doing a real like epic drum roll fill it's so over the top I love it look at this look at this fucking waveform and then like a big pitch down at the end yeah so good <laughs> You can barely even hear it in the song, but when you isolate it, it sounds so good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I completely forgot about that. Um, you're here for a literature core class, boring essay on some books I barely read. Well, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Unless I've read the book. Probably haven't. I don't read books. I just read YouTube comments. Uh, yeah, that was fun. Let's keep going. Um, so yeah, you can see these tom fills are just like audio samples that I've chopped up. I probably repitched a bunch. Yeah, I've repitched each one as well. You can see I've like, yeah. Um, people with Aussie accents can just read off a list of swear words and I'll be like, damn, that's deep. Really? <laughs> Why? I don't get that. Is the, uh, I thought the Aussie accent would be the opposite of deep sounding. Um, you made a Tom feel like this today for the Bauer bot battle. Cool to see this. With lots of panning. Yeah. Well, I should join that Bauer battle. I should do a joint stream with Bauer, maybe. That'd be fun. Bauer, if you're watching. Let's link. <laughs> Lally Experience, thank you for following. Um, okay. I really got caught up on the Tom fill there. Wow. Okay. Uh, we got a shaker sample here. Offbeat shaker. Always a vibe. Uh, again, made from scratch using white noise. Operator, EQ, very simple. Just like white noise, percussive elements. Um, and that kind of covers it. If I've missed any... Oh, there's fill. There's like little fills. I use some of the Sophie splice samples. That's mainly for like the fills and the build and like build ups and stuff. It's not really part of the main chorus sound, but you know, still there. What's this? Another like drum roll kind of loop with velocity. He'd love that. I'm his agent for Twitch. Bao said, okay. Okay, Bao, let's do it. Send me an email, waveracermusic at gmail.com. We'll do it. I should guest judge. That sounds fun. Uh, Matt Symbol, thanks for watching, by the way. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Um... I think we've covered the bass already. Yeah. Um, these chords. Oh yeah, this is, I, I forgot about these. Okay, so someone did ask about the chords before. That was a long time ago. Um, the chords in this song are fun. It's all the same progression basically, except for the build, like the breakdown and build. What is this? So Serum, anyone who's a producer knows what Serum is the best like bread and butter synthesizer for digital producers. Uh, unfreeze, let's see what we got here. It's just like a very, yeah, it's probably like a bandpass filter. Yeah, there it is. One oscillator, saw waves, unison, a bandpass filter with some resonance. Bit of chorus and dimension, and that's it. Simple is good, folks. Um, uh, cutting out the lows, compressing, bit of saturation, bit of EQ, a little bit of reverb for some like space, uh, cutting out more of the sides here. Yeah, I think you probably can't hear that without headphones, but, um, there was a bit of like build up in the sides and the low mid. So I was like using the mid side EQ to remedy that. And that's kind of the main chorus synth sound right there with the bass. 
And then, yeah, like you can see the utility is ducking for each kick drum hit. My email is waveracermusic at gmail.com. You can also find it like on my social media profiles and it's on my like SoundCloud and stuff. It's public knowledge. If you'd like to send me an email, I will try and respond. I'm not very good at responding. <laughs> But wave racer music at gmail.com. Yes. Um, Hanivasu asks, Hey, wave racer, when you produce a song, do you have the idea already in your mind or do you experiment and come up with stuff on the spot? Um, the latter. I definitely do the experimentation and coming up with stuff on the spot. Very rarely will I have like a fully formed idea in my head. If I do have that, it'll be like a voice memo that I've recorded of like an idea I had for something, but it's never fully formed. Um, usually almost all of my music comes from experimenting with sounds and just like following the idea as it comes uh yes oh thank you thank you nina las vegas for the follow if you're watching say hi uh stales mcgales thanks for tuning in and thanks for following nlv's lurking nina say hi if you're here um so that was like the main synth sound right there. In the build-ups we have... I mean, I don't even know if that's un worth unfreezing, but I'll do it anyway. It's literally just like a filtered saw patch. So... Very simple. All the synth sounds in this song are pretty simple, really, apart from some of the FM stuff. Um, hey, Nina. Uh, yeah, one saw wave oscillator, unison at five. Um, basic like Moog style low cut low pass filter some width EQ compression and then LFO tool it's the same guy that makes serum he makes LFO tool Steve Duda he um it's just like it kind of just does automatic ducking based on an LFO it's really really useful like can add movement to a sound I use it all the time like without it you just got this stale, like, very flat sounding chord pad, but then a little bit of ducking. Because like the amplitude modulation, which sounds really nice. Um, oh god, people are chatting, what's up? Yeah, let's keep going. So we've got those sounds in the build, and then we've got... That's the same sound, for some reason it's on a different track. Um, I guess I did that on a different track because it's got filter automation opening up the filter for that like one bar or whatever. Uh, Omni Choir. So that must be Omnisphere. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is the build section. Let's talk about the build section. Unless I've missed something. If, if there's anything that I've missed in these other sections like in the chorus or the pre-choruses or the verses, let me know and I'll go back to it. But the build and breakdown section of this song is really fun. This is actually the part of the song that Danny... Did, had the most influence over Daniel Hall because like you can hear well, I'll just play it. there's another build that comes after that but like that breakdown is cool like firstly the like the chord loop is not in a regular time like let's listen can you take me higher, higher? Can you it's a loop of three like listen to that and every loop of three <laughs> it goes up a fifth so that was like hugely Danny's influence there. I didn't like kind of blew my mind when he composed that. I was like, how do you, he made this like circular thing. Like, cause it's, it's based on the circle of fifths. So you can like, that's infinite. Like can like, you can cycle around the circle of fifths infinitely. He's modulating around the circle of fifths, but the way that we've composed the progression, it goes... So it's like not a regular time signature. I don't really know how to describe it. It might be in three, it's like a, a, a grouping of three placed in a series of four bar loops. Someone who knows more about music theory can, can like verify that, but... Um, yeah, super cool. And like you can see the MIDI here, it just kind of cycles upward. 
and eventually you would come full circle to where you started but i didn't actually do that because i didn't have enough time in the composition to like go full circle i actually just repeated it twice and you can see one two three four five six so it's based in sections of three sections of two bars which adds up to six bars and normally you'd be doing things in groups of eight in a song like this or in a four four song so that was cool <laughs> And the other thing conceptually, which is also part of what Danny did, is like he came up with the concept of like climbing up higher, like going higher, which is I brought that concept to Olivia when she did the vocals as well. And I was like, we want this song to like be reminiscent of, of ascending higher. Um, and this musically is like, it's just a perfect musical representation of that. <laughs> It just keeps climbing higher and higher, and you could go forever because the circle of fifth cycles higher and higher forever. It's so cool. Anyway, uh, so that's kind of these are just like really over the top hardcore like synth arps, um, just like distorted and modulated like saw waves and serum with some filtering and stuff. And then as the second repeat comes around, like there's this added and lush. Let's unfreeze that. It's kind of a cool sound. It's like based on like, I guess, trance kind of synth patches. Yeah, just like really big saw. I think what I was going for with the sound design here was deliberately over the top. So that's that. We've got some drum loops in the back to give it some tension. Very nice. Then after that, so after that cool crazy section, we've got a build that takes us back into the chorus. So this is more like... We go back to the, the normal chord progression. We've, we've escaped from the cycle of fifths and we're climbing back up to pop music heaven. <laughs> you heard this on Cole's radio the other day? That is crazy. I shop at Cole's. Why don't I hear it on Cole's radio? Um, that's awesome, though. I think I saw your Instagram story. We, did you post an Instagram story saying you heard my song on Cole's radio? Because I think I saw that. Uh, yeah, that made my day. Um, that's so weird. Cole's radio. You did, yeah. I knew it. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you hear it on Cole's radio, just, maybe just camp at Cole's. And if you hear it again, make another story. And I'll make it public. Maybe. Uh, you have to camp out at Cole's, though. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I shop at Cole's and I've never... Never heard my song there. I have heard my songs in other stores, but Coles is iconic. <laughs> All right, this is pretty intense. This is like getting right back into the main chord progression of the song as we approach the final chorus. So, <laughs> what happened there? I think the pitch bend automation got glitched out. Can you take me high? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so funny when that happens. Uh, yeah, I think it's the... Um, sometimes it does that. Um, you need to see that fill? Yeah. I think we all need to see that fill. Let's see the fill. Here it is. Oh. Pretty good. <laughs> uh, 
I'm so sorry. Oh god. When you isolate the drums like that, it's so funny. So Matt Symbol says, at around 37 seconds into the song, the instrumental clears and there's a lot of space for the vocal. Can you talk a bit about how that mixing opens up the vocal so much? Sure. Um, 37 seconds. And actually once I will use that to tangent into the vocal that I did here in the build as well. But so 37 seconds, where's that? Let's have a look. 37, like around here. <laughs> Can you take me higher? Was it that part you're talking about? 37 seconds. Can you take me higher? Can you take me higher? After that. Higher. Oh, so yeah, 37 seconds onwards is like the chorus, right? Yeah, I think. I, oh, yeah, right, here we go. Yeah, there is a lot of space in the vocal there. So I think what I've done here is I've got different tracks for different sections of the vocal. So I've got like a verse vocal track or a verse vocal group and then like a chorus vocal group. So they're processed differently and it also means I have them like mixed and leveled differently. So let's have a listen. I never want to see the ground. Don't you let me down. So that's the verse, and you can hear there's like echo and reverb and delay, and um, it's kind of sitting in more of like a flowy space. But then, as we approach the chorus, can you take me higher? higher. Take me up. A lot of that disappears, or like that ping pong delay is gone, and the vocal firstly gets a bit louder, I think. Yeah, a tiny bit, like half a dB louder as well. Can you take me higher? higher? Take me up and hold me tighter. tighter. Give me my desire. desire. So what that is is like I've taken out a lot of the wet effects and the wet effects being like the vocal, uh, the, the reverb and the delays and stuff, that takes up a lot of space and like can create mud, which is really cool if you want to have like a spacey vibe. And I do want a spacey vibe in the verses and pre-choruses. But when the chorus hits, I wanted it to be super clean, cut and dry. So I took some of the, I like reduced the amount that I was sending to the delays and, and reverbs, which means that the vocal just sits above everything. And then you combine that with the fact that it's boosted in level. And I might even have a little bit of extra like EQ on there to boost the highs. Yeah, I think I do. So you can see I've got different processing chains on here. Um, I see the sun and the stars now. I never want to see the ground. And then there's... Can you take me higher? Well, yeah, the pre-chorus is like drowning in distortion as well, so... Can you take me higher? Take me up and hold me tighter. Give me my desire. Keep me close and keep me flat. So that's another reason why it sounds like the dichotomy between that really distorted vocal going to heaps of reverb and delay and then the dry... Can you take me higher? ...chorus. And I think I've got like an extra bit of like doubler to give it some width and chorus. So that's the basic gist of it. Um, I think that's, I think that answers your question. Give me my desire. desire. Keep me close and keep me flying. Keep flying. Baby, don't stop climbing. climbing. To the top, we keep on rising. Good question, Matt. Um, thank you for asking. Now, yeah, so you can see I've got like different processing on different vocal sections. So like that helps to keep each section distinct and have it be like different chapters of a song. So if you have the same static vocal sound throughout the entire song, it can get a little bit, I guess, even if it's compositionally very interesting, your ear wants to hear a bit of diversity in the type of sound it's hearing. It doesn't want to hear the same sound over and over again, especially with a song that has vocals throughout the whole thing like this one does. That vocal needs to sort of change tonality, change timbre, change texture as it goes. So that's why I dedicate different channels and groups for different sections. So I've got like my verse vocal section, all that kind of stuff. And then... Of course, I've got backing vocals that come in and out for different sections as well. Um, and in the breakdown, I've got a whole extra group just for the breakdown vocals, the build. Can you take me higher, higher? 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 
So these are like little chops of the chorus vocal that are all in different layers. They're all, these ones are panned and this one's centered, but it's like little chops of the vocal that are swimming in modulation and like plate reverb and stuff, um, which is deliberate because I want it to be like <clears throat> spacey as we build back into the chorus. And like I said, like that chorus comes in super duper clean and punchy. So I'm just using these effects to kind of create that dichotomy. Um, can you take me? And the vocals rise in pitch as that circle of fifths thing is happening as well. So yeah, just kind of leaning into the concept of going higher, that vocal is going higher and higher as that progression progresses. It's meant to sort of be like a a transcendence, a representation of transcendence or ascension. Um, then we've got... Can you take me higher? Can you take me higher? Can you take me, can you take me higher? Can you take me... Another like textured vocal element that's deliberately filtered. Someone asked, oh, Zort's Music asked why so many compressors. I honestly don't know. I would normally, this is like excessive even for me, but I think it's because each compressor is not doing very much. Can you take me higher? Can you take me higher? Yeah, so each one's only doing like one, this is doing like one or two dB, this is doing like two or three, and this is doing like two or three. So, can you take me higher? Can you take me higher? The reason I do that is because each of them has different ratios and different release and attack settings, which means I can really fine tune how the vocal or how the compression responds to the vocal. So instead of doing one compressor that's set a certain way and doing a heavy amount of compression, I can use different stages of compression to be like, okay, this one, this compressor captures just the, the peaks. This compressor is doing like a more slow character kind of pumping sound. This one's really aggressive or this one's gentle. Um, and I do that deliberately so that I can really shape how the compression sounds. And that I think is part of the reason why the vocal sounds so clean as well, because it doesn't sound like it's being over compressed, even though it is quite compressed. Cause you can see that I've got like different stages of compression happening but each one is only doing a small amount, so it doesn't change the sound that much. It's a good trick, like using multiple compressors doing small amounts of things rather than one compressor doing a lot of stuff. Um, is it to spread gain reduction? Yeah, basically that's kind of what I was saying. I think I probably articulated a little bit more in depth than that, but yeah, that's kind of it. Um, and I have, once I've built like a vocal processing chain, I generally have like a bass processor rack, which I'll use as like my, vocal admin to be like this is what this is how I want the vocal to be how much I want it to be compressed and EQ'd or whatever and then from there I'll break it out into the different sections and be like okay the verse needs this effect on it the chorus needs this effect so I have like different stages that I treat the vocal um because like a raw vocal recording is super duper like raw sounding it's never going to be like good so I have to do a fair bit of work just to get a regular vocal recording sounding usable and then once it's usable, I then like do another stage to make it like sit in the mix better or like be like characteristic in some way. And then from there, I'll do like more processing to give each section its own unique quality. Um, so it's kind of like treating each process as like its own like process. <laughs> That's a really what dumb way to describe it, but there's no one there's no one set of things that I do to a vocal to make it sound good. I'm doing everything in stages as I produce the song. So it's like first I'll be like, okay, I need to make this vocal usable. Next thing, oh, I need to make it sit in the mix. Okay, next thing I need to have a characteristic effect. Okay, next thing I need to make it like not as loud or whatever it might be. And each of those things will take up several different processes that all come together. So that's why there's so many different compressors and plugins and stuff, because each of those things are playing a different role in the in the process. Um, yeah, microprocessing, I guess you could call it. Um, it is possible to go too far and I do that sometimes and then you have to reassess, like turn everything off and start again kind of thing. Are the vocals me? Asks Lotus Cloud. No, they're not. They're a singer called L Divine from uh, England, London. And I explained at the start of the stream, uh, this song was written and recorded when I went to London back in 2017. So. That's uh, that's the source of the vocal. Thanks for everyone who's been following. We've got Plastered Plate, Uncle Toggle, Tamoose Trun, Aeong Wolf, Sarah Hamilton BS. Thanks so much for following. 
Um, so yeah, delay it. And of course, that's a good way to create variation between choruses. Um, um, and I think this is a double. Wait. Yeah, so this is like a double chorus. And then. A little outro, which is basically just the chorus again, but with the vocal taken out and some other elements added for some melodic variation. And that's kind of the end of the song there. But there's also these violin stabs, which I don't think I mentioned. Uh, there's a few things I haven't really covered yet, but I'll try and do that. Uh, if we go to the melody group here, we've got, yeah, these like violin stabs, boom, boom. Violin stabs are just from contact, like literally like a violin preset in contact. And you can see I've just done EQ, delay, compression, bit of reverb, pretty standard stuff. Uh, there's this guitar patch, which is kind of cool, actually. I should probably mention that. Um, this is not a real guitar. It's a synthetic guitar, which is funny because I actually am a guitar player and I do play guitar on my recordings now, but at the time I did, I did this instead. Like I said, this was a few years ago. This is a weird patch. And this is one of those examples of like when I was just experimenting with sound design and then it turned into a sound that became a song kind of thing. It's this weird plucky thing that kind of sounds like a kind of sounds like a guitar strum, like a muted guitar strum. Honestly, I don't really know how I did this. Got a couple of envelopes controlling the warp and the tuning. So like pitch envelope and warp envelope. The warp envelope is a sync. And then this is a sine wave. Um, and then there's a bunch of effects on it. That's without the effects. That's with the effects, which is just compression EQ, overdrive, erosion. That's always nice. Adds like a kind of, I'm on the sign setting, which is like a kind of a bit crushy type of setting. Saturation, equalization, more of it. And then this is oh, the glue compressor, which is just your classic SSL style, analog style compression. And there you have it. That's the guitar sound. Oh, we got some questions. Cheeky bit of hesitation for the listener. That's right. How do you avoid getting tired of what you're working on while working on it? I take breaks so that, like, I'll take weeks away from a song and then come back. This song, like, I took, like, months away from this song before I finished it. And then when I come back to it, I have a fresh perspective. And I, and I love it again. Because, I, I, like, yeah, anyone who listens to a song 500 times is going to get bored of it. So you have to take breaks. You have to be like, allow yourself to do other stuff and then come back. Um, thanks for tuning in, Egna Rock. I'm glad you learned a lot and um, I'll see you next time. Uh, for some reason, it sounds like bangerang from school. <laughs> kind of does. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, it does kind of sound like bangerang. I, that's not the reference I was going for, but you're right. It is quite reminiscent of that. These streams are amazing. I love your music and seeing how it was made. That's cool. Um, it's a good song. Thank you, Swagmaster70,000. I thought it was Swagmaster7,000, but no, no, no. Swagmaster70,000. Wow. Okay, so we've got that. I love this thing. So... <laughs> 7,000 was his grandfather. Yeah. And 700 was his great-grandfather. Swagmaster 7, he came in the first fleet. Uh, this is a vocal sample, vocal G3R. Um, again, this is like a sample probably from like a machine sample pack kind of thing. I don't know where I got it, but it's this cool like recording of, of female vocal singing. And I've put it in a sampler and put some glide on it so it kind of just like loops around and like. And then I created a melody with it. That's a really good sound. I, I, I use this sound quite a lot. Um, and this sound is kind of creating like a backing vocal type sound. Oh. 
and ours in the back but it's totally synthetic which is kind of cool yeah that's kind of cool um, and the bright melody here that's again revisiting the m1 we've got voices pad from the m1 which i'm almost certain is just a straight up preset called voices pad yeah this is a really cool preset in m1 it's like a fluty, vocally kind of sound, which is really, really nice. And then a similar sound from Omnisphere, but it's also got an added like tingy glockenspiel on top. And then when you lay them together, get a little nice sparkly melody embellishment there, which is cool. Um, God, there's so much here. I didn't realize there'd be this much in this project. Like I said, I haven't visited this project in quite some time. But how long have we been going? Almost two hours. Well, that's good timing because we are, I think, almost done. So here we have our little effects section. Someone did ask about this before. Um, <clears throat> so we got like little reversey swooshes here. Kind of, this is kind of just ear candy, essentially. This chi wind chime is, is Ableton's stock Latin percussion wind chime. Oh, shit. Uh, Latin percussion wind chime. Uh, I love that sound. It's just a really cool wind chime sound. A little bit of a white noise sweep, which I created myself. Just filtered white noise from operator. Um, this Someone asked about this little squidgy sound. Which... Oh, not that one, sorry. This one. Yeah, that little... What is that? I think I made this sound in another project and I brought it into this because I needed some more, like, syncopated ear candy. I have a feeling this is a wavetable thing that I, like, must have made from scratch in Serum. Like, you can draw waveforms in or whatever. And I did that and then put a bunch of modulation on it and a little bit of, like... It's just literally like a backgroundy sort of kind of pitchy sound. It's good to add, sometimes it's good to add like stuff that like, I just threw that sound together in like two seconds, but then it kind of is good that it sounds weird and not very musical. Cause against all the other stuff, it creates quite a nice like accent. Um, yeah, it's just all over the place. It's like pitchy, there's not, of fun um sarah's so good for making like crazy sounds like that you saw me perform in orlando in 2015 god that was a while ago i do remember playing in orlando i think i did that once or twice that must have been the flash drive tour or maybe even before no i think yeah that was flash drive tour um what was that contact library you used for claps i don't use contact for claps i use contact for violin piano like orchestral stuff like that um, sex official asks hey Tom what fuels you while writing are you completely sober while composing do you use caffeine or pure passion um, I don't yeah I'm I drink coffee yeah I love coffee but I don't use any other substances to fuel creativity um, I find that they those things kind of hinder creativity for me so um, yeah coffee and food and stay hydrated that's very important um Swagmaster70000 asks, what, who inspired your genre? I don't know that it's my genre, so I can't really comment on that. Um, and there is no specific set of inspiration that... It's like so many different things. And you'll soon find out as I start putting out new music that all those... Like, the sound has changed, so it's very much a different... I'm, I'm, I'm drawing on different influences now than I was when I made things in the past, which is uh, a good thing. Um, the Beecham was the venue. Yeah, I vaguely remember that. That's cool that you saw me there. That was so long ago. I mean, what, 2015, five years ago? <clears throat> um, the Chime reminds me of your All you, My Friends remix. Yeah, I think I used the exact same Chime sound in that. I might do an overview of that one as well, <clears throat> another stream in the future but for now 
might have to wrap this up. Let's finish off what we haven't gone over. There's a really cool sound right here. <laughs> That's like a backgroundy build sound. So I'm again, I made this using Serum. Uh, it's literally one saw wave with some unison voices, a bit of distortion. And then I've got these macros mapped and you can see this weird spiky EQ right here that, um, so I mapped, I mapped this weird spiky EQ because I wanted it to be like a weird notchy sound. So I like did intense boost and intense cuts to make it sound kind of vowelly. but then I mapped all of these points so that you can move them up and down with this macro control, right? So you can see me moving that. But then also that Makura control here is also controlling Serum. And what's it doing in Serum? It's controlling this macro, which is mapped to the master tuning, which is the pitch. So as I move this macro, the synth is changing pitch and the EQ is changing its setting so that it goes up and down to filter the lows or the highs and everything in between. Um, I was, I'm so dumb. I was literally pointing at my screen as if you could see it. I'm so dumb. Uh, <laughs> so what I've done is I've just automated that macro control to go up and you can see everything moving as it goes up. And then there's just a bit of compression and overdrive on it. And it sounds like an engine revving, which is kind of cool. Um... Yeah, and so that's kind of a cool... So, like, it's... I think in when I was making this, I was very into the idea of using very simple sound sources, like very basic um, oscillator sources, nothing crazy, but then using the ability to map and, like, use effects afterwards to make that the character of the sound. So starting with basic building blocks and then seeing what kind of crazy stuff I've come up with with basic tools after. So, like, this is just an EQ and a macro knob and I created like one of the craziest sounds ever which is really cool because it starts super duper low and then it goes really high but you're yeah give it a try there's so many cool things you can do with macros um if you use Ableton and the fact that you can map the uh actual like stuff in the plugin itself like the pitch control within the plugin and then also have the same macro control controlling stuff outside of the plugin that's really cool. So much control. Um, so that's a cool sound. And I've used similar things in other projects too. Like once I created that sound, I, I used it a bunch of times in other stuff. And I think, oh yeah, this is another cool effect, the noise laser. So we've got, it's kind of like doubling what the claps are doing, just like building up over time. Uh, and I just wanted it as an extra texture and it like is just a rhythmic percussive driving thing. And it's just, what have we got? Two layers of operator, white noise. This one's got a notch filter on it and this one got a bandpass filter on it. So two layers of white noise, each with different filtering on them. Um, and then we've got some EQ compression, a bit of multiband just to make it sit better and then some plate reverb this is uh sound toys little plate i think this was free i don't know if it's still free but it was free when i got it it's cool it's just like a nice sounding analog plate reverb um wonder if logic has that feature i don't know if logic has the kind of control that you can do with effects racks as ableton like one of the best things about Ableton is that you can build these racks. I, I am not a Logic user, so I'm not sure, but I know Logic is very powerful, but I just, all I know is that you can do this in Ableton very easily. Um, yeah, there's that. And then this is a sample. This is literally a sample from freesound.org. Sandy RB, the legend, put out a bunch of free, like, instrument samples and sounds and they're just like public domain so anyone can go get them um that's such a cool little like synth zap 
Shout out freesound.org. Um, yeah, so there you go. And I got a bunch of other little booms. This is a custom boom that I made with like a reverberated kick drum. Um, again, exported it as a sample. We we'll probably repitched it. Yeah, it's pitched down a bunch. Gives like this deep texture behind everything. Um, I mean, that's kind of it, guys. Oh, did I cover the ops? Yeah, I covered these ops. And there's some other ops. I think for this one, I normally use the Ableton arpeggiator, but I think because I don't know if you know this, but I only recently learned this. You can you can record the output of the arpeggiator, like the MIDI that's coming out of it. So I recorded the MIDI so that I could then edit it. So I recorded, I used an arpeggiator to create the sequence and then I just saved it as MIDI, basically. And then this MIDI is playing a very kind of over the top unison-y like synth patch and serum. Simple stuff. And then, yeah, just a bunch of other layers of a very similar thing. Um, and then there's this cool, what's this? Those are both instances of Silent. It's a plugin that I barely use anymore, but I'm glad I used it here because it does have a cool sound. Two little arps. You can see the arpeggiator there. I've got it frozen. I don't really think it's necessary for me to unfreeze that and dive in, but if you want me to, I will. Um, arpeggiator just doing the little sequence there. You can see the MIDI's just, it's got a chord put in there and the arpeggiator's just breaking it out into individual notes. Um, it also helps that the chords are like nicely voiced and they follow the progression really nicely. Um, oh yeah, I haven't covered that either. What's that? Uh, contact, I believe it is the harp. Oh no, it's session strings. So we've got spiccato, which is kind of like staccato. So like a very fast little arpeggiated. You would never be able to do that with an orchestra in real life, but thanks to modern technology, we can do whatever we like. So we've got contact, session strings pro, um, spiccato up, Little splashy up with some delays, and that's kind of only used like once or maybe twice. Oh no, it's a few times. And oh, there's another layer there. What do we got? This is a journey of discovery for me as well as you as well as you guys. I, I've forgotten all of this. Yeah, so one of them's pizzicato and the other is staccato. But it's the same thing, just like different types of articulations. Um, and I think that covers it, guys. Oh, we've got a few little vocal, little reverb effects sends here. Background-y. It's like vocal delay. Vocal reverb. Just adding like some effects in the background. And then on the master, we have... I don't do this anymore, but at the time I had a, a multi-band dynamics on the master just to like help glue the different parts together. Can you take me higher? It's not doing that much. It's like pretty subtle. Um, and then I've just got Isotope Ozone 7. At the time I only had Ozone 7, but obviously I use Ozone 8 now, but I don't know even, I don't always use this anymore. Um, but yeah, it's got some equalization, a bit of... Give me my desire Keep me closing, keep me flying Baby, don't stop climbing Some more EQ and then just a big old fat limiter But I did get this song professionally mastered So I didn't use the limiting on this uh, for the final I, I sent it off to a mastering engineer to do it properly So that is higher, guys um, 
if there is anything else that I've missed, anything that you're yearning to to know, yearning for me to cover, I'd like to also say thank you to the followers we recently got. We got DJ Premium Time Flex. We got Stejorin and we got Connacar One. Thank you so much for following. Um, there's a pitch down squeeze effect that you have on most of your fill ends. Could you go over that real quick? Let me see if I can find that. What is that? What is that? What is that? What is that? Oh, oh, this thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is that? I, it's a frozen piece of audio. I think it's just a really quick pitch bend down on like a synthesizer saw wave. It looks like I've exported it. So I must have bounced, bounced it down from somewhere and then I've chopped it. You can e I could even expand it out further. Sorry for that background noise. Um, yeah, that's all it is really. Um, I, I wish I could tell you how I made that, but it's, I think it's just a really fast pitch, really low down pitch envelope on a, on a, like a saw wave or something. Maybe with a, maybe with the lows cut out. Cause it's kind of, when you cut the lows out of a really low sound, you get that squelchy, like kind of weird filtered effect. Um, so yeah, sorry for missing that one on the first wave. Ah, uh, you like the drum beat. Thank you, Swagmaster. A hi-hat catch on the downbeat is so dope. Thanks so much. Yeah, hi-hat processing is always fun. Um, this song is honestly such an amazing collection of ideas and experimentation refined into a really digestible track. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite proud of it. I did mix this one myself as well. I don't mix all my songs myself. I do sometimes, but this one I mixed myself, and I'm quite happy with the mix. Um... But I think that pretty much covers it for the song breakdown. Um, so let's go back to the the welcome room. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I guess I'll take a few minutes to like just chat to you guys. If there's anything else, even in unrelated to music or unrelated to the song that you'd like to ask or talk to me about, um, I'll be here for another few minutes, so shoot, shoot away. Um, and yes, I'd also like to tell you guys that I'm going to be attempting, trying my hardest and probably succeeding at making this a regular type of thing. Lotus Cloud Music, thank you for the follow. Um, yeah, going to be doing this. I'm going to try to do this once a fortnight. So... If that interests you, you can put it in your calendars that I'll be doing this at around the same time uh, that I did it today, once a fortnight. So it's Thursday here in Australia. It might be Wednesday night in America. But, um, and either if you miss it, it doesn't matter because I'm going to keep it up so you can watch it back later. Um, and I'm going to try and also get some clips and the full archives of these streams up on my YouTube channel as well. Uh, in the process of setting that up now. But yeah, I'm going to try and do some of my older songs. I'm going to do some other types of content, like not just song breakdowns, but like other kinds of stuff too. i um, going to try and do some interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, and a lot of people have asked me to do like older songs, like older remixes that I did and uh, older stuff like the Flash Drive EP and that kind of thing. So it sounds like you guys are interested in that. And to be honest with you, I'm less interested in doing the old songs and more interested in going over the new songs, but I can't cover all the new stuff um, because a lot of it's yet to be released. I will try and do as much of that as possible. Um, we are working, like other than this, I'm working on getting my biggest body of music together that I've ever done. And I'm very proud of it. And it's finally in the final stages of production. So that's always, that's very exciting. And that's what I'm spending the majority of my time doing. But in the meantime, I am liking being able to go over my process with you guys and be able to chat to you guys and keep you updated on things. Um, Sex Official asks, what are your thoughts on mixing and writing in headphones versus monitors? Um, I use both. Um, 
monitors are really good um, to just like get ideas started. I use headphones when I really need to hear details, um, especially things like stereo details. Um, but either is fine, whatever makes you feel good. Sometimes using headphones too much makes me have a headache, so I take them off. Because no one likes to have a headache, so. Um, yeah, whatever floats your boat, really. I mean, these are pretty affordable headphones. These only cost like $250 or something. And then I use pretty basic HS8 Yamaha monitors, which is nothing special either. That being said, I do nowadays for the professional stuff, get my stuff mixed by someone who has much better gear than I do. Um, 